This is Ms. Clemmy, and welcome to the podcast on an introduction to the human body. And what we're looking at here is the inside of a human stomach, and those folds are called rugae. And essentially, they're, they're there so that the stomach can expand when food is inside of it. So there's a particular structure, the anatomy, and a function, the physiology. So we're already spending a lot of time on this here. Oops. Is the anatomy and physiology of our body. What is, what is it and what does it do? Now there's more to it than that though. We have to really get into detail now. Why is it shaped the way it is? You know, why does it have that particular function? So for example, if we look at the outer ear called the pinna, it's shaped like that so that it can better canal and corral, excuse me, um, sound into the ear canal. Or over here, the small intestine um, has those little fingers so that it can increase surface area and absorb more food. It's a very particular structure for a very specific function. So it's known as a structure-function relationship. We'll be looking at lots of those throughout the year. For example, we're going to be looking at morphology this year and how we look at big, big, gross anatomical structure, their morphology, how they're shaped. We'll look at the tissues of our organs. We'll look at the cells. Here's an example of a tissue sample and you can see individual cells. Um, cells the study of cells is cytology. Um, embryology, they'll look at the development of humans prenatally before they're born. Um, we won't spend a whole lot of time on genetics but we will talk a lot about genetic disorders. Um, so we'll talk about genes and how those are passed on. And finally, a big portion of our year will be spent studying pathology, which is the study of disease. And we'll learn different diseases for different body systems as we study them. Now, when we look at all these different aspects of anatomy and physiology, there's some basic organization to the human um, being that you need to know. And the most basic, simplest level is at the cellular level. And everything starts there. From there, if we get lots of cells working together, we have tissues. And if we have lots of tissues all working together to do something similar, we have an organ like a heart. And then if we group um, several organs together that kind of do the same thing or work together pretty closely, we have an organ system. And this is where we really will be spending a bulk of our time is these organ systems, the skeletal system, circulatory, the endocrine system, the immune system. And then when we have all those systems working together, that's when we actually get the entire organism. So you should know those basic structural levels in the human being. Now we're going to move entirely on to something different, which is um, anatomical position and all the different relative directions in your body. So that as we're studying these organ systems, you know where they are with reference to other things in our body. And the first thing I really want to start off with is anatomical position. And basically it's this position right here. It's standing upright with palms facing out. And if your palms are facing out, that's known as what's called a supine position. Prone being the opposite, where your palms be facing um, toward you instead of out. Anatomical position is pretty important when we're studying diagrams. So say, for example, I wanted to talk about the right um, femur of this individual. Well, I don't really know, you know, where where is that on her? Well, it's as if it was in her body if she's in anatomical position, so it's going to be on this side of her body. Okay? So make sure whenever you're studying diagrams, remember they're drawn or they're written in the context of somebody in anatomical position. Some more anatomical terms, and these will go pretty quickly, and we'll do them in opposite pairs. We have superior and inferior. Make sure you know one means toward the head, the other toward the feet. The other pairs, posterior and anterior. Posterior towards the back, anterior towards the front. And then proximal and distal. These are usually having to do with your limbs. So one means closer to a joint, one means farther away from a joint. Um, for example, your knee is proximal to your toes. It's closer to the hip joint than the toes. 
The last couple anatomical directions that you should be aware of are superficial versus deep. Superficial, um, that part, that meaning towards the uh, surface, and deep meaning well the opposite, and much deeper than that. And the last one is medial and lateral. Medial and lateral has to do with the midline of the body. If that was a straight line, you can imagine where the midline is. Medial means it's closer to the midline, and lateral means it's farther away. So, for example, if we're looking at the heart, the heart is medial to the lungs. The heart is closer to the midline than both the lungs are. So make sure you know all those anatomical directions uh, forwards and backwards. Moving on to planes of the body, there's a few of them that you do need to know for this course. The first is a transverse, and that's just cutting the body in half, upper and lower, superior and inferior. Then we have sagittal, which is cutting into right and left halves. So you can see if I can try and get it here. The sagittal plane is that division there. Then frontal, cutting into anterior and posterior, so cutting the kind of lengthwise down the middle. Okay, those are the three, or excuse me, four body planes. Body cavities. Make sure you know these. Now there's a bunch of different body cavities, but I'm going to tell you the major definitive um, difference between them, especially the first two that we'll do, um, is this right here. Is the divider, which is the diaphragm. That separates the major cavities. So it separates the thoracic, which you can see over here is anything above the diaphragm. And it includes the mediastinum, and that basically just means the heart cavity. It also includes the pleural cavity, which is right next to the mediastinum on both sides, and that includes then, oops, your lungs. Okay? So the thoracic cavity all combined contains the mediastinum, which is your heart cavity, and the pleural cavity, which are your lungs. That's all above the diaphragm. Below the diaphragm is the abdominal pelvic cavity. Named such because it houses the abdominal cavity, which has your stomach, your small intestine, your liver, all those organs. And it also is made up of the pelvic cavity, which contains your kidneys, your bladder, any reproductive organs. Okay, so that's the abdominal pelvic. It's everything that's below your diaphragm. You can see here there's the pelvic cavity, and all this is the ab abdominal cavity. Those are the major body cavities. But there are two more. There's the cranial cavity, contains the brain, and the spinal cavity, which basically is just the little holes in your vertebral column, which contain your spinal cord. So those are the major body cavities. We're just about finished here with a basic introduction and navigation of the human body um, with different regions of the body. And we have the axial region and the appendicular. And you can see over here that it is color-coded the appendicular is in blue. So the appendicular really just includes your legs and arms and basically, you know, your appendages. And the axial is everything else. It's your head, it's your rib cage, it's your thoracic chest cavity, all of that stuff. So you can see the yellow is the axial and the appendicular is the blue. So those are the two main body regions. Now, when we study the body and all the different systems, there's some major goals that need to be accomplished by the body every single day. And I'm going to start off with this picture. And this picture is a guy that's balancing on a teeter-totter. And essentially that's what your body is trying to do every single second while you're working, while you're playing, while you're eating, while you're sleeping. It's trying to stay in balance. And that balance is called homeostasis. That means everything's in check. It's in balance. And so essentially what your body's doing is it's surviving. It's trying to find a way to stay in homeostasis every single minute of every day. And it depends on that homeostasis. But homeostasis depends on something else. It depends on your body being able to respond to the environment. What temperature is it? Uh-oh, it's too cold. Well, what do I have to do to survive and get back to homeostasis? 
And in the end, everything that your body does to respond and to stay balanced on that teeter-totter is always uh, cell very much cellular in nature. And the cells all working together, then they enact a whole organ response or a whole organ system response. But everything really does start at the cellular level. And that's the ultimate goal of our body as we study all of these systems throughout the years, to stay in homeostasis. Now, to stay in homeostasis involves lots and lots of feedback loops. And these things are a great way for your body to stay in tune with its surroundings. This is called negative feedback, and this is something that you need to know for sure. And it's anything your body does to bring it back to homeostasis. I don't care if it's too high of a level or too low, we got to get it back to where it's balanced on the teeter-totter. That's negative feedback. Here's how it works for blood sugar. So say your blood sugar gets too high, you eat a, a big meal. And so your pancreas uh, has a little mechanism for detecting that. It can test your blood sugar. And so it releases insulin. And that insulin then goes and tells your body to store some of that extra sugar so it's not floating around in your blood. So your blood sugar level goes down. But what happens if you don't go um, for a meal for a while? You skip a meal, your blood sugar gets too low. Your pancreas monitors that. And it provides feedback to your body and says, hey, you don't have enough blood or enough sugar in your blood. You need to take, you need to um, release some glucagon so that you can get more um, sugar into your blood. And that's what happens. The liver then releases all that stored sugar into your blood. So negative feedback, whether it's too high or too low, you always find a way back to homeostasis. Your body temperature does this too. If it's too high, there's certain mechanisms in place. If it's too low, there's certain mechanisms in place to get it back to the middle. There are also positive feedback loops. Now, these aren't as common, but it's anything that makes your body travel away from homeostasis. For example, I'm going to do a great drawing here. This is my finger. And say I get poked, and this is blood gushing out. Okay, there's going to be platelets that come to my rescue that are in my blood and they're going to help to clot it. They're going to come along and they're going to start forming this mesh to stop the blood from flowing out. And those platelets release a chemical that say, more platelets, come over here, stop this, make this mesh, make this stop, this human mandate stop. And those, those platelets are going to call over more platelets. So you're going further and further away from homeostasis, but you're doing so to survive. Okay, Childbirth is another example of positive feedback where the contractions and the mom pushing release a hormone which furthers the contractions which then you have more contractions, you release more of that hormone, and you keep cycling away from homeostasis to get that baby born. So these aren't as common, but you should be aware there are positive feedback loops. Those go away from homeostasis. And we're almost finished here. Exercise physiology. This is kind of um, an interesting field of study because exercise, which we should all do, actually makes our bodies go away from homeostasis. We're breathing faster than we need to. Our body temperature may rise, etc. So it studies what happens to our bodies. How do we recover when we um, intentionally go away from homeostasis? And I thought it would be fitting to end our discussion on an introduction to the human body on what happens when we die, an autopsy. What actually happens in that uh, forensics lab. So after we die, first, we examine the exterior if there's anything, any evidence there of death. And then you always see it on the CSI shows. They make the Y incision on the thoracic cavity to look at the internal organs. And then if necessary, we need to look at the tissues, a histology report, if you will, or maybe a toxicology report to see if there's any alcohol or something involved in, in the cause of death. So that's a really broad general introduction to the human body. You should know all those anatomical directions, the anatomical supine position, the planes, the regions, 
all of that stuff. So make sure you took good notes on this and be prepared for the unit test at the end. So thank, thanks for listening.